Even though we're not meeting together in person, the Salvation Army still has bills to pay and needs to meet. Your tithes and offerings are not only important, they're essential. Despite being distanced socially, God still loves a cheerful giver. You can give online through the Tithely app, that's T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y. Then look for the Salvation Army Seattle Temple or the Salvation Army that is closest to you. If you don't have the app, you can mail your tithe check to us in the office. Or if you simply want to support our community relief efforts, please make a donation online at hopeinthecity.today. Thank you, and God bless. Good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We're so glad you've joined us this morning. I would encourage you, wherever you are, in your home, in your living room, with your family, to stand up and join us in praise and worship of our risen Lord and Savior today. I want to encourage you to leave a comment. Let us know who you are. Let us know where you're watching from. And if you have any prayer requests, you can do that as well. Let us know how we can pray for you. We've got a great morning of praise and worship planned for you today. And I would encourage you to, to worship with us. Engage in what you see on your screen. Join us from wherever you are and sing your praise to the risen Lord. Church, rise up and rejoice.
He is risen. He is risen indeed. We welcome you this Easter morning. My name is Bill Yuri. This is my wife, Diane, and we serve at National Headquarters. We want to join you, all Salvationists in this country and beyond, and all Christians around the world, as we rejoice in our risen Lord this Easter morning. We greet you in his wonderful, powerful name, and we're asking him to come in the middle of incredibly difficult times to show us again his delivering and redemptive power. We greet you in his risen name. Let's pray together. Glorious Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the beauty of this morning. In this dark time around the planet, we lift our faces to you, the light of the world, the living Savior. You are our life. You are our victory over all despair, over fear, over anxiety, over our sin, over death, over disease. You are the victor. We love you this morning. We thank you for your strong arm that you reach into our lives, that you take hold of us, you grasp us, and you bring us into your very life today as our living one. And so, Jesus, we come to you with rejoicing in our hearts, and we lift our souls to you, and we ask for you to pour in hope and joy and peace, and we ask, Jesus, that you would help us to sense your living presence with us today, and we worship you. We surrender to you. We give you our lives, our only life, our Redeemer, and the lover of our souls. In your precious name we pray, amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Charles Wesley wrote one of the most magnificent of Easter hymns, Song 218 in the Salvation Army Songbook. Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. The second verse boldly declares, vain the stone, the watch, the seal. Christ hath burst the gates of hell. Death in vain forbids his rise. Christ hath opened paradise. This song encapsulates the gospel message and gives reason for the living hope that is in our hearts. Over the ages, there have been many attempts to dispute the reality of the resurrection, yet all of the gospels agree that the tomb was empty. Our God is not a God of the dead, but a God of the living. The angels have echoed that reality. He is not here. He has risen, they declare. There are the many eyewitness accounts of the risen Christ appearing to different groups of people and individuals. These include, for example, an encounter with Mary Magdalene, the women returning from the tomb, Peter's special meeting with Christ, and many more. Paul later records in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6 an instance where Christ appeared to over 500 disciples in one place. The transformation that we see take place in the lives of the disciples because of these encounters with our risen Lord is truly astounding. Such radical change and transformation still occurs today when men and women, boys and girls, open their hearts to receive the risen Christ. Nicky Gumbel, who developed the Alpha Course, puts it so well when he says, Our Lord is alive. The apparent defeat of the cross turned out to be the greatest victory of all time.
Will you pray with me, please? Most holy God, today is the day that we praise the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is risen. Today we proclaim that you are alive, that you live. Uh, you live within us and we live in you. We are your body, one body with many parts. And today, in many places, some distant. But we're not fearful of distance or solitude because it's part of the foundation of our faith. In times on any day that you don't seem to be there, we still live by your power and light without any doubt. On any day, we live by the strength of an apparent emptiness where we may not feel your touch, but know without question that you're holding us firmly. It's true, we don't fear distance or solitude because if we dedicate ours to you, it becomes a place where holiness blooms. Although we don't sit or sing side by side today, this body, this voice, this church, your church, lifts up the name of Jesus. And in his holy name we pray. Amen. Jesus, seen he had thy feet. You alone my need can meet. Nothing but thy blood, nothing but thy blood can save me. See my heart, Lord, how I grieve. It's your pardon that I need. Nothing but thy blood, nothing but thy blood can save me. There is nothing I can bring. I can be free. No. 
Today's scripture reading is from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the hand and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is God's word, and we believe it. Good morning. Happy Resurrection Day. This is the most important and wonderful day of the year. To paraphrase the Apostle Paul, without this day, without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there would be no cause for our faith at all. So this is a wonderful and holy day. It is different to celebrate it at home. We usually have great festivities together, but perhaps on this Easter Sunday, we can celebrate in an intimate way with our Lord and Savior, thanking him privately for what he did for each of us, rather than joining together in a celebratory group. We're going to look at the resurrection through the eyes of Mary Magdalene. And we're doing that because this is the last Sunday in our Her Voice sermon series. Before we talk about how Mary experienced the resurrection, I'd like to give a little bit of background about her. This comes from Luke chapter eight. I'm reading verses one through three. Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their means. Mary was an amazing example of faithfulness to the Lord. By the way, the word Magdalene simply means that she came from the city of Magda. It's not her last name. Mary was healed by Jesus from seven demons. And it's very interesting that she then joined him and his forces as they went out to proclaim the kingdom of God. I think that's interesting because she had just had her life handed to her over again. I don't know how long Mary had been plagued by demons, but when we read other stories about demonic exorcisms in the New Testament, we find that people had often been plagued for many years by demons. So it could have been the case that she had struggled for a long time with this affliction. And one might think that when her life was given back to her, she might go off to make all her dreams come true. Maybe she'd look for a spouse and start a family and do all those kinds of things. But instead, she gives up everything to follow Jesus. She even commits her finances to the mission. Mary became pretty significant in Jesus' movement. We know this because she's referred to by name in the scripture. Jesus had many followers. It wasn't just the 12 disciples. In fact, scholars think that he had hundreds, perhaps even thousands of regular followers. Maybe they weren't with him the entire three years, maybe some came and went, but he did have a large group of consistent followers. And the fact that Mary is mentioned by name means that she must have been pretty significant to the movement. She's one of the few people 
who remained with Jesus to the very end. When he was crucified, we see just a tiny handful of his followers present. John, his mother Mary, another relative, and Mary Magdalene, and that's basically it. There to the very end with Jesus out of extreme commitment to him. I don't know why she would do that. It was an amazing demonstration of faithfulness and dedication because she must have thought that his death spelled failure. She had connected herself to this mission, to this Messiah, and now he was dead. That wasn't what she had expected. Maybe the movement she had joined would seem completely purposeless, and yet, instead of running off, she stays. There are many moments in Mary's life during the last few days of the Passion story. Really, from the crucifixion to the resurrection, there are several moments of her life that I think compare to moments in our lives. With each of those moments comes a question for Mary and a question for us. Mary's first moment was the moment at the cross. And the question at that moment must have been, what are they doing? What are these people doing to the Messiah? Why are they killing this good man, this man of hope and joy? What is the purpose of this? We don't know how much she understood of the true mission of Christ, but we can pretty much guess that she didn't think it was going to end with his death, but rather with his earthly victory. So she must have asked herself at that moment, the moment as she kneeled near the cross, she must have said, what are they doing? As we come to our moment at the cross, our question isn't, what are they doing? But rather, what have I done? What have I done? that led to this moment? What have I done that meant that Jesus had to die? In Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says this, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. When we come to the cross, we should be examining ourselves what have I done? Of what sins am I guilty? Christ died for me. He died for you. What did we do that put him there? And it's a good exercise to review those sins and repent of each one, to remember what we have been, what we have done, and bring it to the cross and lay it there and ask for forgiveness from the Lord Jesus. What have I done? that put him there. The next moment, I think, in Mary's life would be the in-between moment. I mean on Saturday, between the day of Jesus' death and the day of his resurrection. Now, I can only speculate. I've never met Mary. <laughs> but I would imagine that her thought at that point would be, what will I do without him? She had given up her life. As I said, she, she had invested her resources. She had left her hometown. She was part of a traveling group. She hitched her wagon to a star. And now he was dead. What was she going to do without him? Before that, she'd been plagued by demons. So maybe she didn't even have much of a life back in Magdala to go to. Even if she did, how do you go back to a regular life after being a disciple of the person you thought was the Messiah. What will I do without him? In our in-between moment, the question isn't so much, what will I do without him? But rather, what am I trying to do without him? What am I trying to do? We might say to ourselves, I know who Jesus claimed to be, and I know what they say. He's God. He's the savior of mankind. He's the conqueror of death, the forgiver of sin. Light and love come from him. Peace and joy come from him. You may even think the people that I know 
who steadfastly follow Christ are the happiest and most fulfilled people I know. Their lives have purpose. So the question is, what am I trying to do without him? Why am I doing this without him? Someone I know who recently received Jesus as Lord of his life said that he is so glad about the timing because he couldn't have stayed sane through the COVID crisis without Jesus. He understands now that no matter what happens, he's safe. Even if he got the virus, and even if he should lose his life, he knows Jesus conquered death. And so there's nothing to fear. So the question is, why would we try to live without him? Do we really think that life is better without the involvement of the God who made and designed us and made us for the purpose of having a relationship with him? Do we really think that we can create a better life separate from him? Do we really think that life could be richer and fuller and more meaningful without connecting to the very God who designed us? What am I trying to do without him? Mary's next moment was her moment of seeking. On that Sunday morning when she went to the tomb and she saw the man she thought was the gardener who actually was the Lord. Her question in her moment of seeking was, what have you done with my Lord? Desperate to find him, even if she had nothing more to offer him, even if there could be no more connection because he was dead, the best she could do, she was bringing spices, it says in another gospel. She was bringing spices to, to treat his body. He could do no more for her. He was dead as far as she knew. It was over, but she was so dedicated to him that she would still even minister to his dead body. She was desperate to find her Lord when she saw his body was gone from the tomb. What have you done with my Lord? In our moment of seeking, the question is not, what have you done with my Lord? But rather, what have I done with the Lord? Have I sought him or have I ignored him? Am I under the impression that his death and resurrection have nothing to do with me? Because it has everything to do with each one of us. He is the creator of us. He died to bring us back into relationship with God. And he rose again so there would be victory. What have I done with the Lord? Have I ignored all that? Have I pretended it doesn't matter? Have I gone on with my life and not cared? Not cared that the God of the universe would become human and die the most miserable death imaginable to find me? To save me? What have I done with the Lord? And finally, Mary has a moment of clarity when she realizes who Jesus is and she says, Rabboni. She didn't say rabbi. Jesus was often called rabbi in the New Testament, which means teacher, teacher of the Torah, teacher of things religious, rabbi. A Rabboni was something different. Rabboni means great master, a greater teacher. Someone who reached Rabboni status was someone who had perhaps had generations of students underneath him, and those students had become teachers of others. So he was sort of the super teacher. And technically, literally, Rabboni means great master. And that's what Mary called Jesus when she had her moment of clarity. Great master. Our moment of clarity. Will we recognize Jesus for who he is? Will we see him and say, great master? Master is a very personal thing. When we call someone 
a master. It means they have control over us. They are in authority over us. It's not something that's said casually. Many people see Jesus as a teacher or a prophet. They always have. But will we acknowledge him as great master? The one who has come to intervene in our lives personally. It is an honor. It is a privilege to be in relationship with the great master. I can't see my audience today, but I would imagine that there are several types of people. And I have two specific types of people in mind. Those who call themselves the disciples of Christ and those who are maybe seekers, maybe just droppers by people who don't claim to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ, a personal relationship, who maybe are curious. I hope those people are out there today who are just listening in to find out. To those of you who identify as disciples, you may feel that you've already got a lock on all these things that I'm talking about. You may think, I received Christ as Savior. I asked him to forgive me for my sin. I know that I'm his child, and I know that when I die, I will live eternally in happiness with Jesus Christ. But consider this. Sin has two great powers. And by his resurrection, Jesus conquered them both. That's why the news of the resurrection applies to everyone today. The two powers of, the sin, of sin are these. It enslaves people in this life, and it separates souls from God in the next life. Let me read from Romans 8, beginning in verse 5. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. Now skipping down to verse 22. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Christians, you recognize your freedom from damnation because you asked Christ into your heart and you had your sin record cleared. You know your eternal status. You rejoice in that. But have you claimed your freedom from the enslaving power of sin in your daily life? Are you living above sin. It says that we died to sin, that we are no longer slaves to sin. Those things that we do that hurt others, hurt ourselves, destroy relationship with God, all of those things, we can be free from them if we understand that Jesus conquered them with his death and resurrection. So please don't think that all this is just about getting your soul, soul saved so you don't go to hell. It's also about living a victorious life now. Living over sin now. Being free, being happy, being fulfilled now. Jesus died and rose again for that. And for those of you who are seekers, can you recognize that there is sin in yourself, in your life, that there are things that hurt others and hurt you and keep you from having a relationship with God. That's what sin does. It breaks the relationship we were meant to have with God. And we're all born into sin, so all of us had that break. 
but the death and resurrection of Jesus was meant to reconcile us back to God, to erase that sin record and restore us into a relationship with God as it was intended to be from the very beginning. To reach that state, you must recognize that you're a sinner in need of a savior and recognize that Jesus Christ was God with human skin on because only God himself was enough to pay that price. He came to earth. He died for our sin. He rose again and he calls you to him. He calls you by name. He wants you. He made you. He loves you. He wants you. Are you ready to have your moment at the cross when you realize my sin brought him here? And your moment of discovery at the tomb when you realize he is risen and because he lives, I can live too. I can be free and I can know my eternal state that I will live forever in the presence of God. I'm going to pray. For those of you who are Christians, please pray for yourself. The prayer I'm going to say now is a prayer that you may repeat in your heart, mind, even out loud, if you wish to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray that prayer and if you pray that with me, if you are ready today to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would love it if you would give us a call, let us know that that happened, or email us, text us, whatever. Let us at the Salvation Army at Seattle Temple know that you made that decision and ask, ask any questions you want to ask. We're ready to answer them as best we can. So if you want to know Jesus, Pray with me. I understand, Lord Jesus, that you are the Son of God, part of the Holy Trinity, that you are divine. I understand that you became a human being and that because of the sin of humanity, you let yourself be killed. I understand that that sacrifice erases the sin record in my life. I ask you to take away my sin. I ask you to be the master of my life. I understand that you were powerful enough to raise from the dead and that you will raise me out of my sin and when my physical body dies, you will raise me out of death as well. I understand that that's what it means to belong to you. And I want to belong to you. Forgive me, Lord. Receive me into your family. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Again, if you prayed that prayer, please call us, the Salvation Army, 206 seven eight three one two two five or email us or however you'd like to contact us we'd like to answer your questions we'd like to help you guide you and for those who are already christians remember sin has no power over you unless you let it jesus christ died and rose again to set you free. He is risen. He is risen indeed.
and I felt foolish calling out your name. They said you were dead and gone, and all my prayers were in vain. But you were there, you were there, even though I couldn't see. You were there, you were there. You never once left me. Morning came again. I couldn't bear the pain. I had to keep moving. My aching crying who are you looking for I saw the tomb empty stone rolled away from the door where have you put him have they carried him away and then your familiar voice whispered out my Yeah.